Hello everyone, welcome to REA's online LANS lecture series. Today we have with us Yuk Diaz, technology transfer engineer who will give us an insight on how space technologies can be transferred to Earth applications. Yuk is based at the Technology Transfer Program Office of the European Space Agency, so he has first-hand information about patenting at ESA, the licensing scheme, and interesting stats about inventions by domain and by application. Luke will, Yuk will also present some examples of success stories. I would like to remind you that you can attend the lecture either from your computer or via tablets and phones using the Adobe Connect free app. If you face any technical issues during the lecture, you can send me an individual message via chat so that I can help you out. For those who may attend for the first time, the Real Lunch Lectures is an initiative within the company aiming to raise awareness of our projects and the skills of our international team. You will have the opportunity to discuss and ask any questions you may have during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Uh, and you can use also the chat box during the lecture if you need any clarification. Yuk, welcome and thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much, Pauline, and thank you very much for the invitation today. Um, as Paulina said, um, I'm very happy to, to be sharing today with you a little bit of information of um, technology transfer in ESA, but also in general technology transfer and how technology transfer um, is now, I have to say, impacting RIA and could even uh, be more important for RIA and, and the clients of RIA um, at some point. So it's very interesting that I can be sharing this with my colleagues and hopefully with um, uh, some clients or partners, partners, of, partners of, of probably as as Paulina was telling me before we started, um, it's the f one of the presentations that is less technical. So uh, of course the work that we do is more outreach and and try to see how these space tech uh, uh, could be used in the market. But in general, it's also how the RIA expertise could be used in other sectors because this is basically uh, what technology transfer is about. It's quite related to a concept that you may be uh, probably heard about, which is open innovation. But of course, uh, we don't have time to go into detail of open innovation, but technology transfer has a, an important role in, in this open innovation. Role. The only thing I'm going to ask is if you have questions, please feel free to um, be sending them during the presentation and then maybe we can go through them uh, or send it to Paulina. And Paulina, if I go too much uh, out of time, please let me know because I don't want to have people um, that may be losing too much of their lunch or investing too much time on this. So I will try to stick to the time. Okay, no problem. So I'll try to put you in context. Um, so I will start my role in ESA TTPO. So this is the team. This is all the people that is working in, in ESA TTPO. The head of, the, of this um, office, because it's not uh, a division, it's an office, is Frank Zosgiver. And I'm this one that uh, is uh, under, or I'll, I'll, you have the, the blue rectangle on me. So uh, a little bit on myself, I'm, 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 I'm from Girona, it's a, a region north of Barcelona in, in Spain, in Catalonia. Uh, I'm a telecommunication engineer and I worked for some time doing technical work in uh, basically digital video broadcasting uh, in Avertis Telecom, which is a, an important uh, operator now. I think they, they changed the name, the name to Cellnex. So working basically with uh, base station configuration and, and, and implementation. Uh, but then uh, I always wanted to work in, in innovation stuff, creation of companies, uh, technology. So I started in a small consultant, consultancy firm that uh, was linked to a public initiative in Catalonia. Uh, and for six years I worked there. I did technical work, but uh, mainly my, my activities were to business development and uh, commercialization of both the services of the company and commercialization of technology. This is how we got to work with ESA at some point two years ago. And um, I guess they liked how, how we did the things and they offered me a job here in the TTP and now it's been 11 months that I'm working with RIA and, and ESA. So one of the things I wanted to do for you is um, technology transfer. Probably all of you have an idea of what it means, but I wanted to go to Wikipedia. I always think it's interesting to see how people try to define certain topics which are, which are not easily explainable. So here they say, you know, Wikipedia says that it is a process of transferring skills, knowledge, technologies, methods of manufacturing, samples of manufacturing, and facilities among governments or universities and other institutions to ensure, well, I can read it all, but sorry. 
sorry, my fault. Um, but basically, you, you see, if, if I try to explain you what is technology transfer and you read what Wikipedia say, probably you will tell me that you don't understand what I'm talking about. Um, that's what people used to do with most of the topics they do to try to make the others feel that they are not smart enough to understand. But what we are doing basically in technology transfer is um, use the knowledge, the experience that some people have and the technology that they have developed. Sometimes it's formal and sometimes it's not formal. Formal rights, I'm not going to go into details, but could be patents and others. Uh, and they use this technology or know-how that was initially developed for a specific topic in other sectors. So Wikipedia say that technology transfer is close to knowledge transfer, which is very much true. Of course, knowledge transfer is more a concept also in which you share good practices, maybe the way you do things and not that much on the technical uh, background. But where I think it's interesting and, and they point out what, what we really do is you basically move where one technology or know-how was initially developed to another application, to another sector. And this is what we are basically doing also for a space um, in ESA, in the TTP. It says it is presented basically horizontally, and it's true because um, vertically it would be that you use it in the same sector in different applications. Uh, but now what we are looking basically is more horizontally. So let's say that we develop for a space, but we look in automotive, we look in aeronautics. So, of course, in the TTP, in ESA, we are here, we are in the space, we, we have the, the, the ISS where we do a lot of activities and an incredibly high investment to make it work. We are also here, we have uh, Rosetta, a uh, super successful mission, uh, also a lot of money there. But of course, we are also in different sectors. So some sectors in which we are, which is uh, kind of interesting, we are now doing a, pro a project with, uh, with Eurofusion. It's related to the first, um, it's a, the, it's the ITER. So ITER is the first fusion testing facility uh, that should be the, the, the first step to reach out or to achieve uh, fusion reactors uh, at some point. So it would be clean energy, supposedly, without no radiation. So some know-how coming from, from space, and I can tell you it's uh, from the manufacturing capabilities that are around Ariane 5, we are, which you produce big pieces uh, for the Ariane 5. They are producing the, the, the magnets uh, for the rings of the uh, ITER. Also, of course, um, in the case of, of, of aeronautics, uh, we are using quite a lot of technologies, automotive, um, probably you heard about it, one of the technologies that was developed by one of our inventors here at ESA is now being used in a Omega watch, which hopefully some of you get one. And uh, finally, last year we just did the work using the spacesuits material um, developed by DuPont at some point to create uh, some underwear, I know it sounds weird, but underwear for um, uh, manufacturers of uh, steel industry. I will talk about it a little bit later. So basically, again, this is what we do. We are looking for, um, in ESA TTP, we are looking for using space technologies in nine space applications. You see all these things. What is um, What I would like to just do a differentiation a little bit is um, when we talk about use of assets, like, uh, and when we say assets, it means uh, data from, from uh, satellite information. This we don't consider technology transfer itself, but it's more utilization of assets. And as you may know probably, and I will uh, talk about in the next slide, uh, or in two slides, we also have some an initiative of artist program that is called uh, uh, IAP, uh, Integrated Application Platform, and they are looking more at this usage of um, uh, yeah, assets, let's say, data to create applications. And, and in which, as you can see, I mean, if you are using data, there is no real technology, but just information that you are using to create a new a new tool or a new app. So our, our mission, of course, is inspire and facilitate the use of a space technology in, in, in general because we want to create the impact of what the agency is doing. Uh, the investment we have in the TTP is not super high and the revenues that or the return that we create in terms of image and on the space industry is, uh, is, is very, it's, it's super high, it's, it's very good. 
Um, so, of course, there is a marketing part of what we do. Um, of course, another or probably the main mission of what we do is that we want the space industry to have all the revenue streams. So uh, the space sector is uh, it's, it's, it's relevant nowadays and it's going to grow quite a lot, hopefully in the next years. But if they can uh, identify other ways of maybe creating another company to exploit an, uh, some know-how or capabilities in other sectors or maybe, maybe transfer a patent to other sectors that gives them money through royalties um, every year without much effort, then it's good for the industry because it makes the whole space industry stronger. Um, finally, we say boost local economy because we are working country by country and later on I will explain a little bit in which countries we are. But uh, of course, the business incubation centers that we have, you know, we have one here in Norbike, others in, in Italy, um, in Spain, in Germany. So what they are basically doing is uh, taking these local entrepreneurs that can create companies and create wealth in your country. These are, I'm going to talk mainly about three activities, but I want to show you five of the activities I was talking uh, or I'm going to talk about. First is uh, ESA TTP is managing the patent portfolio of ESA, of course. We have inventors in ESA, and maybe some of you also as uh, contractors working for, uh, for ESA are also having ideas on, on how some things could be improved. So that falls under the, the ESA, ESA contracts and, uh, and could be protected by, uh, by, by ESA. We also have a broker network, which is basically our commercial arm in the TTP because we have representatives in 14, and now it's going to be 15 because the Czech Republic is also having a, 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 a national technology transfer initiative. And business incubation centers, which, uh, as you can imagine, is basically a typical business incubation center, but with some uh, differentiations that I will uh, talk about later. Then there are two other things. First one, I was talking about uh, this uh, ambassador uh, or the, the integrated application platform. So they have ambassadors that are more or less mirroring the idea of the brokers, but related to the applications and the construction of projects. And we also had uh, or have an investment support uh, area and activity in which ESA was uh, investing in a, in, in, in a venture capital. And also we support some investment forums. It's basically to support the startups that are in this um, environment of ESA through the business incubation. This is more or less our, our network. Um, what I wanted also to point out here uh, is that we have the, this branding ESA Space Solutions in, in ESA. That branding could be used by, um, under request of course, by any company that is using uh, space uh, technologies and they want to put these ESA Space Solutions in their products because it makes it nicer for them and it's easier to market this technology in, in other applications, right? If you have the ESA level, which is, I have to, send one, one, I have to say, one of the strongest um, tools we have in the TTP is the ESA itself to open doors in the non-space industry. So if you can use this logo, use these ESA space solutions in products, then we, we understand and we believe that this could add value to, the, to your product in front of your clients. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about specifically the three topics that I said, patents, business incubation, and brokerage. Um, so for the patents, all of you that have ideas, please feel free to contact the, the TTP. We will be super happy to open the door, talk to you, and see how we can, um, can support on that. I'm not doing it directly, but I have my colleagues here doing that. So whatever ideas you may have, we can support you in, in checking out if it makes sense to be protected and if, if ESA is the best way to protect it. I'm going to um, tell you a little bit about which are the methodologies and how we are doing this process. So basically, there are three reasons why we are um, patenting, at, patenting at ESA. First one is protection, of course. We want to prevent that um, ESA space uh, or the space, uh, the member states uh, space industry is blocked to develop or build some products. Second one, it could be exploitation. Of course, ESA main goal is not to make money out of it but yes to support the space industry to try to make money out of it and be more competitive and in some cases trading because we in exchange of one of our patents we can access other ip or know-how so what we consider uh, an ESA name invention as i was saying is an invention created by ESA staff or contractor 
um, or any invention arising under ESA contract, where at least one inventor is ESA staff or contractor. So here, what we do sometimes is, most of the times, as you know, the uh, the IP of, of the of the of the developments done in the framework of a contract with ESA is owned by the by the client of ESA, let's say, or the, by the company or organization that do the development. So this is where usually the IP stays. But if this company decides not to protect and needs a belief it's important to protect, then we can step in and um, uh, just submit the patent. But also we protect a little bit the participation of our inventors in uh, of, our, yeah, of the staff or contractors in these projects, because if they had a meaningful participation, adding ideas and building stuff, then they are entitled to be in this uh, in the in the patents and probably sometimes get some share of this patent that is protected by another organization that is not easy. So what is important is the inventors have the obligation to report to the patents group, which is a group that um, Odd the clerk is, is the, the secretary. This is the licensing scheme. This is how we license to space and non-space industry ESA patents. So ESA is paying for the maintenance of these patents, which is expensive. But uh, we have ruling to uh, license, this, license these technologies. For, so for space applications, non-exclusive license can be given to the space industry. So of, of course, RIA is a space industry. So if they want to use some of the ESA patents to develop certain products, certain idea, they can use this for free. But it's a non-exclusive license. So other people can use this license as well. And for non ESA space industry, then they have to pay market conditions. So let's say if we agree with the Indians that they want to use one of our patents or, or, or the South, Ameri uh, South Africans, they have to pay. And here it is where it goes more interesting is in non-space. So we always apply market conditions. And unfortunately, for the way that ESA is treating the assets, we uh, always deal with non-exclusive licenses. Um, well, just to uh, just a remark is IP portfolio covers patents, copyright designs, trademarks, know-how, and everything. But mainly, we are uh, focusing a lot now on on patents, of course. And if you want more information here, you have a link. Please feel free to go in, and you will have. I think that we have around 140 um, patents uh, information uploaded in the ESA website, ESA IP for commercialization website. This is really a bit, um, I just wanted to give you some graphs of, of where the patents are in terms of uh, the, the origin the, of these patents. Most of it is in telecom, as you can see, RF payloads, electromagnetic technologies. So um, this is where we have a lot of, of patents, but of course there are other things like the automotion, propulsion, materials, which we are also trying to focus. And I have to say that sometimes it's easier to um, explain to the market how this could impact their um, the day-by-day -day products. This is the application. Again, as you can imagine, if we have a lot of telecom technologies, the application or the first application is ICT. But uh, there are a couple of others which uh, we believe that we can apply this patent. So it's aeronautics, automotive, energy, uh, even materials again, healthcare, some of them. So this is just an explanation to show uh, that, you, that we have done this mapping internally and we have an idea of where we can apply our patents. But of course, then it's about really making sure that you can do this translation from what we believe that can happen to what can really be done. For business incubation, um, so we have 11 centers nowadays, but I think for this year we have three more committed, if I'm not wrong. Um, so it's an activity that is growing quite a lot. So far, uh, we believe that in 2015, we will be um, supporting the creation or supporting 100 startups in Europe. So we are, uh, we believe, one of the biggest um, incubation activities nowadays in Europe, probably. And so far, we have created 250 or supported these 250 startups. You have, uh, the, the thing is, in the incubation centers, we don't, we can have startups, already existing startups, or entrepreneurs. And basically, they have to be using some technology, or in this case, we accept use of assets to create a new application. But of course, it has to be a innovative um, use of these assets to create some innovative product or, or I mean, if you come and say, I'm going to create a new positioning system for, um, I don't know, uh, agriculture, which we know that there are quite a lot of projects already. So maybe, you know, it's not the best thing to do if you're looking for harvesting. Maybe you have to apply something, some differential thing. 
So this is where uh, we are now. You see this map um, that was done by the by EZTTP. So we, this year we expect that we expect that for the end of 2015 we will have uh, presence probably in Austria, uh, Sweden, uh, Sweden, and Switzerland. Um, before, uh, just some moments ago, I was saying that there are, there are. I mean, probably most of you know how a business incubation center works. So it's basically a place where companies uh, can be incubated, can be can have a place where they can grow with small companies, but also share spaces share the, the support from, from the business incubation manager and other synergies that they can create with the community around them. What makes different, uh, differential what we do in the TTP uh, or the, the ESA TTP is basically we are offering uh, pre-seed pre funding of 50K to do the development of a prototype of your idea that you uh, submitted for the business incubation application. And second one is the technical support that you can receive from uh, from ESA facilities that are around. So in the case of Italy and uh, and Germany in Darmstadt and um, e Norbike here we have uh, Estec or ESOC which are close to these places. But if we don't have an ESA center, what we do is we just uh, link this with the universities and um, other research organization that could be uh, proposing some know-how or adding uh, capabilities of support to the to the startups. So I'm going to show you two examples. Um, Rebobs of uh, well, Rebobs is the product, but Etops is a is a French, Dutch, Norwegian company nowadays because they have presence in in France, in in the Netherlands, and in Norway. They created this uh, remote intuitive intuitive visual display because in the oil and gas industry, uh, what they had until now was basically just lines and alarms very simple in which you were seeing if something was going wrong of the sensing that you had on the on the oil rigs and the platforms so taking the same uh, uh, know-how that was coming from ESOC to uh, see which is the to do the satellite control they adapted this know-how to this oil and gas application oil and gas is actually um, a sector for which we work a lot from a, from a ESA TTP perspective and of course because of space has similarities in the in harsh environments with with uh, with oil and gas. Another case which is um, quite uh, interesting, it comes from know-how that does what, what was developed around Philae, the lander of Rosetta. So um, basically, what they did in this in Philae is miniaturization of uh, of um, some of the system to take some samples uh, from uh, from from the from in during the mission. So this miniaturization now they are applying for the uh, detection of certain uh, fluids uh, that the um, bed bugs they they deliver. So this this is an interesting case because the inventor uh, or the, one of the, the the inventor that was involved in the Philae lander development he created this company and two or three other more using the know-how of miniaturization because of course if you have to go to the hotel take samples go to a lab and then have you know, information of the results of this, uh, of, of the sample, it may take a long time, which you don't really have. So if you have an instrument with which you can go to the hotel, do this uh, identification there and know if something's wrong, right or wrong, then you can make decisions fast. So for the, <clears throat> this is what I'm managing in the TTP. So this is the ESA broker network. Uh, I was saying before that we had 14 and now we're going to have 15 brokers. Uh, we don't have the Czech Republic one here. But basically what these companies or organizations do for us is they uh, work trying to identify, it's like a process, but basically they go and speak with the space industry and try to identify which technologies they have that could be applied in non-space applications. They also go to the non-space industry, speak to them and try to identify which needs they have in innovation. They match these two realities, and then they help in the process of mediation and technology transfer. Of course, they do a lot of other things in terms of promotion for these for the for the ESA uh, ESA network. Uh, but the main goal, basically, they have is link space technology and non-space needs. Of course, what is good of having a network is you don't work just locally, and you have the few needs and few technologies. But what you're working is in a European level in which 
basically each of them is putting needs and and technologies so we can easily match them uh, this is creating quite a lot of interesting uh, work lately i have to say uh, and more or less we are creating around 15 transfers every year and from 19 1982 uh, when the ttpo started working we supported more than 300 transfers of course i was not there but um, the work that was done during these 20 years is now um, uh, I think very solid, solid in terms of what we can offer. And actually, with experience uh, working in several environments in, in, in Europe, South America and, and, and North America, I can tell you that a network like this with, uh, this, uh, with, with 15 partners doing the kind of work they are doing is super, super differential. And we're trying to see how this could be used in other sectors as well. So as I was saying, so they basically do this, right? They do also, they have to identify success stories. They mediate between the space and the non-space industry. They try to promote uh, the portfolio of visa, of patents. They do the technology descriptions to be shown to the, to the non-space sectors. They identify needs. And of course, they are also supporting us to do some branding, some branding, sorry, uh, on what we are doing in the in ESA Space Solutions and ESA TTP. Um, I wanted to talk about an interesting uh, activity that is linked to the to the brokerage, and is the technology transfer demonstrators. ESA has a specific funding to support, as it says here, the transfer of space technology to terrestrial applications where there is a strong commercial uh, potential. So basically, what what happens to us quite a lot is when we start a negotiation, what the receiver of this technology with, with the company that has the need, they they tell us that. How can you prove that this technology could be applied in this application that you are claiming? So what is what we decided at some point to put in place is let's put some seed funding or small funding of, as I'm saying here, between 30K and 40K that can help prove that this, to demonstrate proof that this technology that was developed for space could be applied in non-space applications. And afterward, the receiver, the company that has to develop a product from this uh, space tech, can decide to invest more money to do a final project. So, so far we have uh, a 70% of success out of the projects. So we funded around 26 projects. Uh, we are very much looking at cases in which the receiver of the technology is really involved in the demonstrator. And I'm saying that because the next call will be published between June and July 2015. So if you have ideas or you know space tech, uh, companies that could apply this, of course, RIA is one of them, hopefully, um, then uh, it's interesting to receive them uh, when the application is op open and, and to analyze them. This is the impact we usually expect. So I was telling you, I was talking about, um, we identify, if you look at outputs, we identify technology descriptions. We try to support technology uh, transfer. Uh, and then what we want to do is publish success stories. Again, and going back to what I said at the beginning, what we are looking for is not that ESA makes a lot of money. Of course, this is not the goal. What we want is that we can explain society, the society and the non-space community that the investments that are done in space have a very high impact on society, not just in, of course, scientific topics or telecom topics, but also back to earth, how you explain what is the impact of all this investment of around 4 billion euros or more than 4 billion euros on the day by day of the people. So these cases are, I believe, easier to, to show this. Um, if you are also interested in having more information of the technologies uh, available or we have identified, you can go to isatech.eu. You'll find, I think, at least one coming from RIA. So I'm going to show you four success stories. Uh, probably you saw them in the in the internet or in the ESA website. But the first one is uh, the use of space software, space cap uh, space capabilities uh, to analyze uh, images. So the same uh, uh, technology or software that was used for the analysis of image for MBZAT is now used uh, by, uh, by for for a specific company to look at uh, MRI in brain scans. So we can see which is the deterioration of the, of the, of the cerebrum, I think it's called, I don't know in English, sorry. Um, 
to identify this. And, and so this is a transfer of software that was used in a space and imaging. And I have to say that with healthcare, with healthcare, we are working quite a lot in the usage of the space or the image analysis that come from, from Earth observation in, in other applications. Um, another story related to what I was telling you before, um, this um, underwear that was developed for steel work workers. So the problem that steel workers have is that they're using basically um, outfit that is protected against uh, the heat, but the underwear was not. So when they were working, they had very high temperatures and they had some burns that came from how, how warm or hot was the underwear. So using the, um, this uh, spacesuit technology, they developed this super nice underwear. And the good thing is the company that is behind this underwear is Bjornborg. So probably some of you, if you are interested and you maybe go to volcanoes or something like this, you can, you can buy um, one of these um, kind of underwear that can prevent you from, from getting burned, from getting burned. So you see some pictures here. Um, another case come from um, a development that was done by the Canadian Space uh, Agency. At the end of the robotic arm of the ISS, you have super sensitive um, sensors for uh, well, that is used basically to, to sense the things that you are going to take. So this technology has been used by the automotive industry for the RVEX to make sure that they are sensitive enough to um, jump or be, be launched when, when, it, when they have to be. Uh, lately, we published this other story in, uh, in the ESA website. So the, uh, the, one of the, the, the sensor that is basically doing the monitoring of vegetation for Prova B um, now has been used for the early detection of cancer. So uh, using a specific, uh, this, this technology, basically, we are capable of uh, identifying beforehand if there is some melanoma that, that is being created in skin. And this, is, this has been done, I think, with the Dutch uh, hospital by the Belgian company Tenix. But also it's interesting because the same company is applying this technology in, you know, um, sorting for plastic and recycling. But uh, as far as we know, they are looking for other applications. And of course, RIA has also been doing uh, efforts to uh, diversify their activities. Uh, by doing so, what they are basically, or what we are basically doing is we are Using the know-how we developed in the framework of contracts with ESA, the capabilities we developed in the framework of contracts with ESA to uh, offer these capabilities to other clients. So most of you may be aware of it, but of course, um, RIA took part in the seventh annual NATO Cyber Coalition. Um, and but part of the know-how and capabilities that we're using were uh, developed in the framework of the concurrent design platform and, uh, and activities that has been done there. So just, I'm about to finish, but um, so how, to, how we can leverage on these things that I'm explaining. So just to give you some, some clues of if you have ideas. So see, if as a real employee or a real client, you have ideas of use of space technology in non-space, please contact me. We are super happy to, to check, out, check it out and try to look for, for some return. Of course, it's not super, it's not gonna be a short term thing, it takes time. But we are happy to start the process of putting it in different uh, forums, showing it around, and at some point, probably it gets to a lead. If you have ideas for demonstrators, it's time to start thinking about it. Start thinking about um, a good partner that will receive this technology. Or if you're interested in technology, we can talk about some of the things we have in the portfolio. But um, it's good to be prepared before we publish it. Um, other thing is how we can use EA, is a RIA, sorry, space expertise and, and, and know-how and technology in other applications. Uh, we are happy also, again, from a TTP perspective, but also myself, to support in whatever it's necessary. And if you know companies that could be interested in space uh, technology, let's say that they have some innovation needs, please contact us. We will be very happy to meet them, show what we have in the portfolio, and try to, to move it forward. And just to finish, just what we see from a, from a TTP perspective of how the next steps in the development uh, of space missions and um, what, what is coming in terms of exploration is going to impact technology transfer. We see like there is a trend in which a space will have to meet, meet much more 
um, how the terrestrial industry is uh, targeting some things and the other way around. So it means that in the long term, we believe that there's going to be more spinning in from non-space to space, but also more, more spin off from space to non-space. One of the things, for example, is the the the, uh, the launchers. We believe there is going to happen. There, there are going to be quite a lot of change in in launchers and having probably um, basically competing with the SpaceX, trying to offer differential services. Another thing is, of course, Earth observation is going to trigger quite a lot the development of the space industry. Um, the use of images for certain things, like probably insurance companies, will be super interested in having. 100% of the time monitoring of whatever is happening on Earth. So uh, if there is a crash accident, you don't have to call the police or you have to call them. But what you will do is basically use images and you know what happens. So these kind of things will take some time to come. But at some point, it will, it will, it will happen. And it's going to trigger quite a lot of improvement of software to, analysis, uh, to analyze this information, to analyze the data that we can receive, probably some technologies that, are, that have a higher resolution. Um, so that's part of the things we believe that are coming. And finally, of course, exploration. And this is where, um, from a personal perspective, I also believe, is where more changes are going to come. Um, if we really have to be living in the moon or in Mars, we really have to improve a lot the technology. And in the case of 3D printing, uh, that we have this image here. Uh, of course, the capabilities on Earth are quite evolved nowadays. And we have to see how these capabilities could be applied on a space. But I believe that when, once we do this step of applying this in a space, the improvements that we do for a space could have an impact again on Earth. And these we can apply to several other cases, like uh, oil rigs that are applied or that are used on Earth will have to go to uh, probably the Moon or Mars. But at some point, we will develop uh, capabilities on this oil rigging or rigging, let's say, not oil rigging, rig, rigging and mining that will have a very, very good impact on improvements on Earth. So that's all from my side. Um, hope it's more or less an explanation of what we do in technology transfer. Again, technology transfer is the use of a space technology in non-space non applications for ESA. But it's, a, in general, the use of a technology know-how that you developed in a specific uh, sector of application. And that at some point, you see that you can apply in other sectors. Increasing the revenues and increasing the impact of the investment you initially did. So thank you very much. If you have doubts, please feel free to start as, as soon as you want. Thank you very much, Luke. Thank you. I will enable now the audio for everyone so that they can uh, Ask questions if they want, all the attendees. Maybe. So everybody has the right to use their microphone right now, but you need to activate it. Or you can simply ask a question by typing in the chat box. It's very interesting that there are all these different types of applications, sometimes even funny, <laughs> as you said, but primarily very useful and in so in a, so many different areas. And like the health applications are. Yeah, we're trying. Uh, it's interesting what you're saying because, um, yeah, well, I have to say that the, the, the probably the, the transfers that have more economical impact or more, more economic impact are not the ones that we are publishing more because they are not that appealing so in the case for example of the underwear or um, there is also the power plate come from the power plate you know this thing that you have in the gym come from the Russian uh, training program when the when the astronauts came back to earth they were using this this power plate and then it was used for the gyms and actually it was a success in terms of, uh, of uh, yeah, economically it was a success but these kind of things is that the ones that we are trying to use from a, from an agency perspective because they are explaining easier and better how this can impact on society. We have another case in Spain, which is you know for the jamón, which is you know of course the Spanish people love this uh, this 
uh, this case because it talks about Hamon, you know, the use of some kind of humidity testing in Hamon, it's super nice. So we try to adapt this to the reality of each country. So if we do something in France, if we do it around wine, it's good. Um, so these kind of things we try to also push forward. It has been a very successful program. The last year, it, the network really expanded. And you mentioned about the Czech Republic, which was which is in the plans but not in the map. Are there any further plans to expand the brokers network as well as the bigs? Well, that's that's an interesting question. Um, um, we are working in the ECTTP in something that's called ESA Space Solution Center. So ESA Space Solution Center is. Um, uh, I'm not going to say a place because it's not a place specifically, but it's it's a concept in which you have the business incubation activity, the brokerage activity, and the access to the IP portfolio of Visa, and information of how to work with Visa all together in a in a in in, in a one window where you can go. So now we are working in this concept, for example, for Norway, in which we already have a broker, but we will have a business incubation center all together, um, and in Ireland probably. Uh, we will have also a space solution center and which will in which we will have business incubation and broker activity and demonstrators um, the idea for the Czech Republic actually is some some something similar because we will have probably business incubation as well and the broker activity so yes I, I think these activities raising quite a lot of interest in the in the member states because it's also, as I said, um, it can create a very big impact with a, with not a very big investment. I see. We have also one of the brokers today in the audience. I don't know if uh, if he or anyone else has any question, but it's we have uh, representatives from all parties, so to say. So who? Ah, Sam. Okay. <laughs> yes. Sam, hope I did not say anything not proper. Okay. Good again. If anybody wants to uh, have more information, you can contact me through Paulina or to, through LinkedIn or Twitter, because we were tweeting with Tristan, I think. So uh, yeah, anybody that wants to contact me, I will be very happy to have a chat at least, have lunch here in Estec or yeah, whatever. Duke, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, it's yes. Low, but... Okay. Um... I have a question. When you look for potential companies to be inserted into the incubator, I mean, there must be a few parameters that you actually check because they have to present the potential for being a success story at the end of the run. This is why you decide to incubate them. So, mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit about what, uh, what is being assessed actually before one company is accepted to be part of the incubator? Well, yeah. Well, the, as as I said, the the application we have s some restrictions. I believe the the maximum the company uh, the time that the company has been created has to be maximum three years or five years. Now I don't really remember. Sorry, because I have to say that I'm not directly involved in the technology evaluation board of the incubation. So I will try to answer this question without putting my feet in in somewhere which I should not. But we are basically looking, as I said, use of a space technology. So if you're using a patent or you're using some space know-how or capabilities and it's proven from, and you are an entrepreneur or a startup company that has been created less than three or five years ago, sorry for not being able to respond to that, then you can apply even use of assets. So, but there has to be an innovative component in this idea. And then the evaluation goes as most of the of the processes in which you evaluate the team that has that is involved in this project, you evaluate the idea and how innovative this idea is, which is the real potential of this to be reaching the market. Uh, also, it's important that the idea of prototyping that you have to do around these 50 Ks of prefunding um, is very clear and it's oriented. So again, what we target um, a lot is that you have a, identific a clear identification of the market. If I answered more or less the question. Oh, absolutely. So let's say the business plan behind the company is very important in the, in the evaluation phase. Yes. Okay. Yes, exactly. Uh, uh, because as you were saying, what we want is, and for the business incubation, of course, the success story, but also 
if we can create a company that in the long term is, you know, creating like 50, 100, 200 jobs, that's, that's the real impact that we are looking for because economically this helps the region to justify any investment that is doing in a business incubation center. That's very clear. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Thanks. I don't know if you still have uh, maybe some if, you, if I miss something from what I said you can add anything maybe there are, there are questions coming so I see people typing Oh, it's okay. <laughs> Sam, if you miss part of it, <laughs> it's okay. So, the question about the yeah. intellectual property. Mm -hmm. Mm. Okay. So, uh, has a question about to whom it belongs the patent, and the example is if it's a software used by another company. So, yes, what happens uh, in that case? In, in, as I said, in general, um, the IP of any contract is owned by the contractor. There are some cases in which, uh, for critical, for uh, critical software for missions. I think most of you know that um, ESA keeps the, the intellectual property. But I believe in general, um, even if it's software, and if it's developed in the framework of a contract, the, uh, the IP ownership should be of uh, the contractor. So I don't know if, Eloise, you have a specific case in mind. So we can, because in general, again, as I said, if there is a contract and there is a space, um, and there is a software that's being developed, then it belongs to the contractor. I understand that maybe you are concerned about uh, background information or something like this. Okay, no, I think that's an interesting topic. If you want to talk a little bit about it, uh, we, will, we, we will be happy. Um, I'm just going to tell you that we started doing some activity also because you know that there is software that is um, owned by ESA. So now we initiated um, a review of all the software because what we have been doing from a TTP perspective is we analyzed all the patent portfolio and now we are analyzing the software portfolio that the agency have, which is owned by the agency or owned by other organizations for, but uh, to which we can support in the commercialization. So if you are interested in this topic, maybe we can, you can come to the office. I have my colleague uh, that is managing specifically the analysis of the software. We have, um, I think it's called a board, but I don't remember the name, ESBL or EABSL, that it's a ESA software board for licensing. And they are checking out how each of the software that is developed by ESA and it's ESA owned, owned somehow should be licensed to third parties. I know it's kind of messy. I don't want to go a lot into details on this, but if you want, we can. We, I'm happy to talk about this. Good. One more, one more question, sir. Um, 
excuse me, Paulina, but um, can I know who, because I know who is Alberto, but I don't know who is Eloise and I don't know who is Sol. <laughs> yes, we have different colleagues in so many different countries. Sol is here with us in the Netherlands, in Norway. And Eloise is uh, currently in Prague. Okay, good. Oh, good. So maybe Eloise, when I go to the bro to see the broker, we can talk there. That's going to be easier. Um, so, so have um, so I guess you are talking about um, the IAP program that I was talking about. This ambassador platform. Okay. Um, so we are okay. As you know, we are tech. Is TTP is under tech, and uh, the ambassador platform is under Artes or Tia. Sorry. Um, we have been trying, or we are trying to work together. We are building. Uh, we meeting the brokers and the big. Um... Okay, sorry, I'm reading now. Yeah. Okay. So. These are, I mean, in Howell we have several things. We have the IIP, basically it's based, it's not based there, but they have activities. But if you're talking about the business incubation in Harwell, um, yeah, they are very active because they are one of the ones that are, uh, that have been working with the ESA TTP for long, for more time. They are also managed by STFC, which is an organization, a public organization um, that is uh, basically linked to the UK government and they do research themselves related to space and other large uh, scale science facilities. So it's easier for them to do the, the identification of potential candidates for the business incubation activity. And of course they have the capabilities in Harwell to support the creation of these companies. If you are creating a company, and of course most of the application related things are, are in Harwell, um, if I were to choose myself, if I create a company that is related to an application topic, of course I would choose the Harwell Business Incubation Center because there is where most of the things are going on and most of the contracts related to these topics are going on uh, and it makes sense. I think this is one justification. And I wanted to also explain the collaboration we have between the TTP and the IIP program. We are meeting twice a year with the brokers and bigs, and we and the IAP ambassadors are also joining, and we are trying to create somehow. The idea would be that at some point these space solution centers that I was talking about are also linked somehow to the IAP. In Portugal, as an example, uh, the broker is IPN Instituto Pedro Nunes. They are doing the broker activity, the business incubation activity and the IIP activity. So it's kind of the, fir the first space solution center. And there, we have the link between all the things together easily. What we, why we want to do that? Because, of course, we understand that it's an economy scale. Um, and because it's easier to create um, whatever you want to create. I mean, if you link the application side with the business incubation, with the brokers, then it's super easy to create new projects, new ideas. And that's the, the goal. Again, I would say Harwell is the is it the the right place to create things uh, to create a company or to to apply for application if you do something related to to applications? Yes, I think it's 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 the nice the right place now. But of course, in Germany we have Darmstadt as well, where you can uh, have whatever it's related to software uh, that you could that you would likely be using uh, in over half at Hofer. In, uh, in close to Munich, we have a very interesting place there that is linked to Airbus. So it depends on what you're looking for, what kind of clients you want to have close, and what kind of support you want to have. Thank you, you very much for the question. Yeah. Hello? Are you, can you hear me? Now I do. Okay. 
Uh, I was wondering if you could touch on uh, how the, the workers can help companies that are being incubated. Uh, I know that, for example, uh, in, in the US, uh, Made in Space was doing 3D printing. Uh, they both received a, a seed funding as well as, a, uh, as an initial contract for uh, putting a 3D printer in, in, into the ISS. And in parallel, they were receiving help from uh, brokers uh, from, uh, from NASA into uh, looking into uh, you know uh, market for uh, for printers 3D printers doing a polymer and uh, aerospace grade mm -hmm. uh, uh, metals is this something that you you also you also doing um, yes of course and I have to say that um, we I mean economically we are just supporting more in the in the demonstrator phase let's say that we give the if the project is awarded then we give them 30 40 k which is not a, a a big amount so it's more I know it's not related to the ISS but it's more for the translation to other sectors so this is the kind of support we can we can give of course if some companies already working with the agency and going to the ISS and then they develop certain um, product or know-how or technology uh, then basically you pointed it out perfectly what the brokers do is they take this technology that was developed in a space and they basically We'll share it through the network. We'll share this information with the other brokers. We'll visit companies and try to identify needs. And at the same time, we as ESA, because we have a very, um, or let's say not very, but an easy way to go into big companies, we can present this. So let's say that we meet with HP, and maybe they could be interested in, in, in some kind of 3D printing for whatever it comes for them. So I believe that we can, uh, as you're pointing out, what we can do is basically opening doors. Then the negotiation part and most of it, it's taken by the company and we can support a little bit. But what we do is we are a, a door opener and we would be doing that. How, how intensive is each broker doing that depends also on them because we don't give them that much resources. We are not paying huge quantities to them. We are just giving them some incentives to do this work for us. Um, but basically, that would be that would be the support. The support would be uh, to to try to identify companies that could be using that. And actually, I think I know some of the brokers that NASA works with, and the model they do is a little bit different than ours. We work in general for um, whatever space company that believes that have a, a space tech that could be applied in non-space applications. And I think NASA chooses a specific projects and give it to the brokers. We give freedom to the brokers to identify themselves, the technology descriptions, the technologies from space, and um, you know, bet then or push more for those that they believe that have more impact. We are more an open and less oriented, probably. Thanks, Rick. Thank you for the question, Tristan. I don't think we hear you, Paulina. Yes, thank you, Luke. <laughs> so I was saying that uh, we have uh, reached the one hour uh, after all these questions, and we had this interesting conversation. So again, thank you very much, Luke. And thank you yeah, all for so. participating in our online lunch lecture series. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for uh, to all for being there. Yeah, 17 people, quite interesting. Uh, we had even some joining uh, the last minute, but the the good news is that for those who didn't manage to join from the beginning and also for some who couldn't make it, a handout of the presentation as usual will be distributed by email and you can always get in touch with uh, Luke to ask um, any further questions you may have. The next uh, rare lunch lecture will take place in uh, September. We have a break for uh, the summer months, June, July, August. And you will receive the invitation by email and uh, through the social me media channels from Rare. If you would like to add any guests in the mailing list so that uh, interested people can uh, get all the invitations directly, you can send me their email addresses. Thank you again. Thanks.